Today we will discuss street art and graffiti. By the end of this lesson, we want to focus on the ideas of what graffiti is, how it's used as a crucial art form to, to introduce political ideas, and contemporary issues of its practice, reception, and the evolving form of its subversion. So, the first issue we have to come across is this idea of graffiti and versus street art. And um, versus maybe puts the wrong connotation on it, but we're trying to differentiate, at least in this lesson, th um, the difference between tagging, which is just like a name or initials or a nickname on a public place that lets people know, hey, I've been here, versus street art, which um, if you look at the right hand side of the screen, is generally speaking a more charged, at least politically, um, narrative sometimes they have or story. And we want to make this distinction clear and not to take away from either or, but from this point forward, we're going to refer to what word we've been talking about, which is street art. And so this lesson is going to focus on these more politically charged narratives. So now that we have defined the difference between graffiti and street art, we're going to discuss how they act in a communicative space. So um, at the most basic level, graffiti is used as a mode of communication, often a subversive context, in which an artist with a typically underrepresented voice is able to gain political agency by illustrating their views. Um, here there's an interplay between artistic content and the pre-described context of the space. So for example, in the upper left hand of the screen, there's a work done by an artist by the name of Blue, and it depicts sort of a characterized image of sort of foolish little cartoonish war soldiers on a government affiliated building. So there's a uh, interesting dynamic between the content of the artwork and the actual site that's displayed on. Um, there's also an interest in the ephemerality of the space in which artists can tag over each other um, and even governments can censor or destroy artwork. But this can be negated by digital permanence. So in the upper right hand, there's a picture of these different um, youthful just, um, graffiti artists with ski masks on and they're filming themselves and uploading it to YouTube. And they paint different subway trains in order to have them go back and forth from station to station and spread their tags more um, effectively. This creates different modes of access in which you can view a piece of art in a gallery space or you can view it in an urban environment. It really questions the authenticity if this is art and how is it subversive in its different contexts and also creates an interesting dynamic between the local or provincial artwork or how it's displayed in a digital medium for a global audience. So we're going to talk about a couple of definitions that involve street art. One of them is subversion, subversion, which is an attempt to transform the established social order and its structures of power and authority and hierarchy. In other words, it's a process by which values and principles of a system in place are contradicted or, revert or reversed. Street art acts as a way of subversion because it attempts to redefine certain places through art and certain political ideas. The other definition we're going to talk about is critical art, which aims to produce a new perception of the world and therefore a new commitment to transformation. It wants to create new meaning for how we think and how we think about art. It doesn't just want to communicate what art is, it wants to have a lasting impact and it wants to be apolitical. It values both the content and the process of critical art making. It's not art for art's sake. The other thing we want to talk about is resistance. And street art aims to resist the typical art historical tradition. It's not in a museum. It's very local. It's not art for art's sake. It truly aims to have a message and a purpose that outweighs the aesthetic value. So to continue with that idea of resistance, um, these are pictures from the Berlin Wall, and we kind of figured that as both a contact zone for uh, these two hegemonic superpowers back in the late 1900s, uh, the USA and capitalism on uh, the western side of Berlin and the USSR and um, communism on the eastern side, 
uh, these you know these two global superpowers met in this city. They split it down the middle and erected a literal just wall separating these two powers. And of course, what happened was that the Berliners caught in the middle were trapped without this like identity because half of them, and it was almost completely arbitrary on the line that it was drawn down. So families were split in two. People might live on one side and work on the other. So these, their identity had all of a sudden been taken over, and as a way to resist this, to claim back some agency or identity from these two nameless, faceless um, superpowers, the people of Berlin started this um, pretty tra um, historic tradition of tagging and graffitiing and uh, painting messages on the Berlin Wall itself. Though it should be noted that this was much, much, much more common on the western side, which was the side controlled by the USA, because the eastern side was where the USSR had set up all of its defensive positions. So there were, um, I don't think there were minefields, but there were gun turrets and watchtowers, and East Berliners were much, much more restricted in their access to the wall. Okay, so here we're going to describe how street art acts as a contact zone, which is a social space where cultures meet and clash, often in context of highly asymmetrical power relations. So in these spaces, subordinate groups have the power to produce art in order to describe themselves to a more dominant group and engage with representations they have made of each other. Um, for instance, in a lot of street art contexts, they exist in places of struggle. So here we decided to choose the Berlin Wall, but a more contemporary example would be sort of the Palestine Wall and the street art that exists there today. Um, so the Berlin Wall reproduces multiple cultural and political histories which intersect and react with each other in this space, sort of um, outlining its communicative aspect with its ability to act as a contact zone, and it creates communication across lines of difference in hi hierarchy and reclaims this imposed wall that divides people apart. So there's an interesting intersection between communication and also the construction of boundaries and peripheries in this space. And for reference, if you look at the picture on the right, the side with the uh, colorful murals is West Berlin, and the side uh, with the sort of no man's land looking area is East Berlin. So you can see the difference in access between the two sides. One of, the big, one of the big issues surrounding street art is the role of authenticity. So for multiple reasons. One reason is government sponsorship. Some artists believe that by making street art government sponsored, it defeats the purpose of street art. And at its core, street art is about g giving people a voice who don't necessarily have it in government. And as a result, having it govern having artwork be government supported silences those voices the second issue is the commercialization of street art graffiti street art becomes commercialized when commercialized when it's in a gallery space for all to see and loses its sense of localized localizedness when artists accept patronage and do paid commissions they get rid of the idea of art being of gra graffiti street art being anonymous and not being commodified in terms of having a name attached to it the third issue sort of ties into the last one which is how it spreads it can it historically street art was spread through migration like from borough to borough in the new york city train system during the 70s and 80s but not having it in a gallery and ha gives it internet exposure, which can help spread street art to audiences who can get ideas and continue to develop and practice graffiti art as a use of resistance. To speak back to the idea of spreading it and how you don't necessarily, how hyper-local messages can be spread to a global audience, um, perhaps one of the more famous street artists, and um, I'm sure at least some of you have heard of him, Banksy. He's a British artist. He goes around stenciling all over the world, I think, but he mostly focuses on contact, um, conflict areas. Here's a picture that he did in the Gaza Strip, and um, as you can see, there's this whole uh, wall of rubble behind it. And on this little remaining section, he um, stenciled and painted on a cat. And a local man had asked him, you know, I like that you're here because you, you're a famous artist and you're going to help get this message across of this destruction going on here. But I have to ask, you know, why is it a cat? And he replies, well, if you want people to see it, people on the internet look at cats. So it shows a uh, an evolution almost in the thinking in that 
if you want this message spread to the world, you know, you have to think how the world reacts. And um, because of this, uh, it actually ended up trending on Facebook, which means, uh, you know, it had sight to millions and millions of different people. So the next issue um, is sort of the artists themselves and their response to all these uh, issues of authenticity. What you're looking at now is a picture also by Blue. This one was in Germany. I believe it was Berlin, though. Uh, it has This is separate from the Berlin Wall. It's not actually where the Berlin Wall was. Um, it's this big mural. You know, It had to have been, as you can see from the cherry picker, a couple tens of stories. And he had painted this image, and the developer, the owner of the land, where the cherry pickers are, actually had wanted to turn it into uh, condos and stuff with a large part of it being that you would have this view of this blue mur mural and it'd be like, you know, having this famous modern day artist to look at outside of your window. It would raise prices and all this other stuff. And in response to this blue, because they would have to kick out a homeless shelter, um, like a makeshift informal homeless shelter that was taking place on that land, blue went back and actually censored his own drawing. And it takes, um, it kind of wraps up this idea of authenticity in that Blue, as a street artist, wanted to keep this subversive act going. And because the powers that be no longer saw it as subversive, but actually as a means of making more money and um, furthering these um, issues, he went back and censored him sh himself. So there's kind of like this uh, cycle you can think of it as. Is, so street art is a subversive form. And then when it's done by a famous artist, it has this commercial value attached simply because the artist has a name that's recognizable. So how, do, how can this commercial um, global art market name be subversive still? And the answer then is by censoring himself and removing himself from the image itself. So that's, uh, that's what's going on in this picture. So we have a couple discussion questions we would like you guys to consider. So the first one is, can you imagine a way in which a location you visit on a daily basis can be altered through the use of street art? Um, so you might want to consider, would you alter it with corporate sponsorship or would you rather create a mural at night under um, the blanket of darkness? The second question is, does the commercialization of certain artists diminish their political and social agency? Um, so does street art have political agency and is it effective? Um, and our very last question or prompt is using Blackboard's discussion board feature, feel free to post images of street art near you. And some things you might want to consider are what, if anything, is the artist attempting to get across? And how does this work manage to or manage not to give a sense of agency to the artist? All right, thank you guys so much for listening to our hook about street art and graffiti.